This will be the first of two lessons on Leviticus, named after its focus on activities of the priestly tribe of Levi, though they're only mentioned by name in two verses in the whole book. <clears throat> so it is the third book of the Pentateuch, or Torah, and continues where Exodus leaves off, with detailed instructions from God to Moses, not just for the priesthood, but also for the people. And this lesson will be all overview because Leviticus needs a lot of context. Uh, Constable's notes in the description as always, his introductory notes on this book include a very good quote. Leviticus has been called the Bermuda Triangle of the Bible because many Christians get lost in here. I thought that was a good description of how we tend to avoid it because it really is of little interest to us. It certainly has no uh, direct application but or obligation, but it is worth looking at for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that critics always look at it, so we should know our book better than they do. But the New Testament book of Hebrews draws heavily from it, so there's at least something to gain from being familiar with it at some level. If Exodus was the preamble of the law, Leviticus is the formal legislation, <clears throat> and nobody likes to trudge through a long legal document. Every detail of worship is spelled out in fine detail, so there could be no need to guess how or whether anyone was pleasing this holy God who keeps them alive in spite of themselves. Unlike other religions, where the adepts and priests hold secret knowledge that the unwashed masses are deemed unworthy to receive, the Levitical system is written out for all the people to see, so they can keep the priests in line, because the authority comes from God, not from them and they all had access to the writings. But keep in mind that what we as Christians can take from this study is the emphasis on holiness and respect for God, not that we must know and practice this law for ourselves. Hebrews 7 explains that with a change of priesthood comes a change of law, and as Jesus taught in parables, you can't mix the old and the new. But above all, the sheer volume of details makes Jesus' fulfillment of it that much more impressive. So the thing is that, especially as I mentioned in Hebrews, you, the law and the priesthood cannot be separated. And since we are not under a priesthood of Levi, but the tribe of Judah, specifically uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek, then we can have no part of this law as something we're obligated to. Constable also points out that to us today, Leviticus reads in a um, haphazard, and repetitive way, but in fact the various chapters and sections each have their own literary structure just as any legal document would have. They would have different styles of presentation for different parts of the contract. Page six of his notes begins a handy outline of the entire book. I don't have that displayed here, I just have a, a random chart I found on Leviticus in general. And But you can go there to the link in the description and, and check out his outline. And I won't be going verse by verse through Leviticus as I have for Genesis and Exodus, but only pick out particular eras, areas of controversy or difficulty. So probably the most important point to grasp is that these rituals and requirements only cover sin. They don't cure sin, or they wouldn't need to be repeated, and this is a point made in Hebrews. We could think of this as renting out or leasing legal pardon until actual payment in full could be made at the right time through Jesus who shouted that very legal term paid in full on the cross at the very moment it was being shouted out by the priest sacrificing the Passover lamb. A lot of people don't realize this. It isn't brought out that the, you know, the Greek word is tetelestai and um, I don't remember the Hebrew word, but this is what the priest would shout out as he <coughs> sacrificed the Passover lamb and that's what Jesus said on the cross, paid in full. That's what it means. Not just it is finished, but paid in full. The debt is paid, the obligation is met. And the sacrifice of animals, which actually began when God covered Adam and Eve with animal skins, illustrates the substitutionary atonement of the innocent for the guilty. There's no escaping this. A lot of people don't like substitutionary atonement, but that's what the Bible teaches in, in from you know, start to finish. Our society bristles at such an idea on the surface, yet we practice it on some level ourselves. For example, if a child breaks a neighbor's window, 
It is the parents who make restitution since the child can't and the child is not a responsible party under the law. The child has no income, no means of replacing the window, is not mature enough to deal with the issue. That's why parents have authority over them and the parents also bear responsibility for them. So this is a substitutionary atonement in a way because someone, an innocent party, is covering over the wrong done to someone else and on, be, on their behalf and it wouldn't be fair to leave the window broken, the neighbor uncompensated because it wasn't their fault either. Even though it wasn't a deliberate act, the neighbor is due restitution for lost property. So we shouldn't have a problem with the concept of substitutionary atonement. So this is a matter of inability to pay, not a method of teaching children to be reckless and irresponsible, provided, of course, that the parents then discipline the children responsibly, so teach them not to make the same mistakes. It's an act of mercy both to the child and to the neighbor as the injured party. In the same way, God provided a way for Israel to compensate him for their offenses on credit, so to speak, rather than striking them dead at the first offense. And as with the child needing to see how much it costs the parents to replace the window, so also the Israelites needed to see the terrible price of rebelling against their creator. That's why animals die. They are innocent. The innocent dying for the guilty because there's an injured party who needs to be compensated and the price is high because we cannot pay it. We are like the child in that scenario and Jesus is like the parent paying it for us. But like anything else put on credit, payment eventually comes due and the Israelites would be forever unable to make it, just as we are, so they would need to be redeemed. And of course, it isn't just Israel who would need help, so God would also pay the ransom for the whole world held under the power of the evil one, leading to reconciliation between God and all mankind. These three R's, redeem, ransom, reconcile, sum up not only the laws of Moses, but also the reasons Jesus had to sacrifice himself. So we've got four R's there. Three of them are the reasons, the justification for the fourth. Redeem, ransom, reconcile are the reasons Jesus had to die and why the, the sacrifices had to be made in the meantime and they pointed to him. Now this may be a good point to define some terms. Pardon or forgiveness takes away the penalty of a crime but not the guilt. Whereas justification takes away the guilt as well, like it didn't happen. There's a difference between the two. Justification means dropping the charges completely. It's not on your record. But to drop, drop charges when there's still an injured party to compensate would be unjust, unless the injured party accepts the pardon out of mercy. What this means spiritually is that the laws of Moses could bring pardon or forgiveness but God, as the injured party, is still owed something, something only the perfect, sinless God-man could provide. And that's reconciliation with the souls he created. But what does it mean to be sanctified? Its literal meaning is to be set apart or aside, and it includes the idea of being separated or distinguished for a spiritual purpose, good or bad. But it can be also applied to objects and animals and days being sanctified, so it isn't necessarily a term of morality or restraint from sin, but more of an identification. At the very least, it signifies the intent or beginning of a spiritual task or state. Ideally, it also includes the completion of that task or maturity in reaching that state. So that's what it means to be sanctified as opposed to justified, according to what I can get out of the Bible. And Paul puts it all together in 1 Corinthians 6.11. He says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This accomplishment of Jesus is the final goal that the laws of Moses could never reach but only rent. So the laws of Moses served to sanctify and at least temporarily pardon the people of Israel, but they can't justify them so they could live forever in God's direct presence. Now we need to address the current resurgence of the Hebrew Roots Movement, 
which teaches that Christians must obey at least some of the laws of Moses, not to be saved necessarily, some of them will say that, others not, but because it's how we please God, according to them. Yet passages such as Romans 7, 1 and Galatians 2, 11 through 21, make it very clear that such a teaching belittles Jesus' sacrifice, since in Christ we died to the law. How can we please God by taking to ourselves a law that was not only specified for the nation of Israel alone, but was superseded by Jesus' sacrifice? When Paul confronted Peter, it was not because Peter was trying to save or justify himself, but because he had lapsed back into practicing the laws of Moses. We cannot please God by doing something that got Peter a rebuke, and a public one. Context is everything, and the context of the laws of Moses and the whole Levitical system is the nation and people of Israel with a physical temple in a physical place on earth, the practice of which would bring physical blessings to the people and the land, and the neglect of which would bring physical curses. Some quote Habakkuk 2.4 to claim that salvation, quote-unquote, was by faith in the Old Testament, but it doesn't say that. It says the righteous people live by faith, not go to heaven by faith. So that's a really weak proof text. In hindsight, we can see that spending eternity in God's presence is granted to Old Testament quote-unquote saints, or righteous people, but they were designated as saints on the account of their good deeds, if done in faith. Even so, their souls could not enter heaven until Jesus made his sacrifice, his sacrifice and took captivity captive, per Ephesians 4.8. But you will find nothing about eternal salvation of the Spirit in this law. You will only find the detailed laws of an earthly theocracy. But again, such a system was designed to keep the relationship between God and Israel as close as possible in this life, so that when people died, they could rest in peace, knowing that God would judge them by how they lived and why they lived that way. For Israel, it meant living according to the whole law. For everyone else, it meant living with a clean conscience, per Romans 2.14. But for us, in the age of grace, it means resting in the finished work of Christ, a gift to be received with gratitude rather than a wage to be earned by performing good deeds. And by the way we please God is not with rituals or by pretending to be Jews, but by being in God's, hand, be, being God's hands in this world. That's how we please God. We act as he would act because he has delegated that responsibility to us. And that's how we please him, not by going under a law, which, as I said before, got Peter a public rebuke. And as pointed out in, in earlier lessons, the purpose of some of these laws is to regulate rather than establish socioeconomic norms such as slavery and the status of women as property. Jesus himself said in Matthew 19, 8, that Moses allowed divorce only due to men's hard hearts. And that he in that section, he is, is that quote, he is referencing Deuteronomy 24. And God's habit is to always choose the lowly and despised to humble the proud and esteemed. And that is per 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29. And per Pe uh, 1 Peter 5, 5, God opposes the proud but defends the humble. So if anyone thinks they're granted entitlement because of their flesh, they've missed the point of not only these laws, but also ultimately the gospel of grace. We need to keep all of this in mind as we study Leviticus, which at least will turn out to be the settled practice of Jewish life for many generations to come. It's just getting started as we're studying it here, and it will be repeated and embellished and fleshed out in the, next, the rest of the uh, books of Moses. But for now, we've got a lot of things established on what it is and what it is not and how it relates to us as far as lessons go and teaching about the, the honor and glory of God and the holiness of God and that he gives different directions to different people at different times. He even changed his law already, as we saw between Exodus and Leviticus where uh, at the end of Exodus, the people abandoned God as soon as Moses turned his back for 40 days. And the law that was given the second time is not precisely the same as the first. There were changes. 
So God does change how he relates to us. Yes, faith must always be involved if we want to spend eternity in heaven with him. But for now, these laws are for a specific earthly people. And it had to do with earthly blessings and curses. And I think it goes without saying that if a person is being blessed in this life and they die in that condition, enjoying God's blessings because of what they've done and why they did it, then they will, in fact, be with God for eternity. And the opposite is true as well. But the point is, we have to understand the overarching context of the whole laws of Moses, not just the book of Leviticus, but in all the other locations where this law will be completely given. And again, the point is that as Christians, we need to at least be familiar with it enough to know its purpose, to know its limits, and to know that we're not under it. So the next lesson will be the only other lesson on Leviticus, and we'll go over some details then.